The ancient Assyrian Empire of the 8th century BC created the world's first professional national standing army in history. First, let's define what that means. Professional means that the soldiers were hired and compensated. Preparing for and waging war became their sole career. Most armies of that day relied on conscripted levies of peasants in times of war, which were supported by a small warrior aristocracy. National means that the army was beholden to the nation-state, which was commanded by the king. This is in contrast to mercenary units and armies, whose loyalties are typically sold to whoever pays the most, and tribal warrior societies, where every able-bodied man was a warrior. Such tribal societies lacked a nation-state to defend, and often sold their services as mercenaries. A standing army is a permanent army which is not disbanded during times of peace, and recalled out of reserve in times of war. And an army is a large number of military units capable of independent action. Sometimes, these armies could be active in the field for several or many years, but were always disbanded when no longer needed. The organization of most late Bronze and early Iron Age armies in the Near East were pretty similar to one another. The monarch was commander-in-chief of the nation's military forces. He was advised by generals, who were also capable of commanding an army independently. The chariotry was the most prestigious part of the army, which was the most expensive to maintain and required the most skill to operate effectively in battle, and were usually manned by the nobility. The next most respected and important part of the army was the king's personal bodyguard. Depending on the time period and size of the state, these units could number anywhere from a few dozen, a couple hundred, or even several thousand men strong. And in contrast to the regular chariotry, the ranks of the king's guard would have been filled with men of typically humble origin, who had demonstrated exceptional military prowess and or loyalty to the king. The bulk of the army was made up from the rural peasantry, most of whom would have been farmers. The summer months, in between the planting and the harvest seasons, was the time for war, and while the crops grew, men died. Ancient armies of the Near East almost always included units of mercenaries as well. Before the ancient Assyrian army turned pro, they followed a very similar military model to other nations in the ancient Near East, with a couple major differences. Most significantly, in Assyria, every man was considered a soldier. The king, the entire nobility, every priest, peasant, scribe, and merchant were all soldiers. They were not full-time soldiers, but they were called to fight far more frequently than any of their contemporaries, sometimes on a yearly basis. This was because of geography. The fertile heartland of Assyria, which was able to support a large population, had no natural defenses, such as oceans, inhospitable desert, marshes, or being at a high elevation, making it vulnerable to attack from the north, south, east, and west. Consequently, Assyria's defense was achieved by its ability to mobilize a large number of troops of a high quality on a regular basis. By the time of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, Assyria had existed for over a thousand years with only one significant period of foreign domination, which only made them more warlike by the time they regained their independence. The same qualities that made the Assyrians great at defending their homeland made them great at attacking others. Assyria's history has several periods of expansion, overextension, and then contraction. They had the ability to conquer an empire, but lacked the manpower to hold on to conquered territories, defend the homeland, and keep the economy running at home. Another major difference between the Assyrians and their contemporaries was how they viewed war. To the ancient Assyrian, waging war was his religious duty, just as many today might consider caring for the poor, sick, and needy as their religious duty. Consequently, the Assyrians didn't even have to come up with a bad excuse to go to war. They always had the same excuse. The god Asher wants us to go to war, so we go to war. Most other countries in history have at least had to deal with coming up with a bad excuse to convince and motivate their people to fight another country, or maybe even a former ally. With the Assyrians, this excuse thing was not necessary. They were motivated already. Let me know in the comments of when you think a really lame excuse was used in history for going to war. Early Assyrian armies used very little to no mercenaries, but their use did increase over time. The king that reformed Assyria's army and empire was Tiglath-Pileser III, he was born with the name Pulu, and served as a general in the Assyrian army, and then as governor of the capital city of Kalu. This was all during a period of extreme Assyrian weakness. The kingdoms of Urartu and Babylon 
were at war with Assyria and had cut off the trade routes, bringing them metals needed for the production of weapons and farming equipment. Assyria's reaction was inept for a few generations, as they were plagued by internal infighting, civil war, and a crashing economy. This chaotic period was brought to an end when the governor Pulu usurped the throne, slaughtered the royal family, and then took the name Tiglath-Pileser III. As a former governor, the first thing he did was drastically reduce the power of the governors. The small number of large provinces with powerful governors were split up into many smaller ones. Most of the new positions were filled with eunuchs, who had no descendants and were personally loyal to the king. Tiglath-Pileser III reformed nearly every part of the Assyrian government structure and bureaucracy, most importantly, the military. He introduced a professional national standing army, which was available for service at any part of the empire during any time of the year. Previous armies were predominantly composed of seasonally conscripted levies of native Assyrians from the area of the empire closest to the campaign. In contrast, the Kassir Sharuti, the professional army, was drawn from the best men from every region of the empire, even if they weren't Assyrian. A path to citizenship was offered for those willing to swear loyalty to the king, worship the god of war Asher, and serve in the army. On campaign, the army was frequently commanded by the king in person, but when he was absent, one of two field marshals. The Tartans of the left and the right could also command the army, with the Tartan of the left being the senior of the two, and was the second most powerful man in Assyria after the king. After rapidly reuniting and restructuring Assyria, Tiglath-Pileser III went on the offensive. Throughout his 18-year reign, he successfully campaigned in just about every direction. He conquered Babylon, first making it a vassal state, and then, later fully incorporating it into the Assyrian Empire. He then defeated Urartu and made it a vassal state, as he did with many other small states in Syria and the Levant. By the time of his death, Tiglath-Pileser III had taken Assyria from the verge of collapse and left it more powerful than it ever had been. Over the next 100 years, Assyria was ruled over by a series of capable monarchs who used the professional army to expand the empire which was larger than any other empire in human history that had come before it. The Assyrians were also great innovators in warfare. They were the first state in history to use cavalry on the battlefield as combat participants. For many centuries, cavalrymen had been used as messengers and reconnaissance by armies. But the Assyrians are the first people we know of to make use of large numbers of men and horses on the battlefield. When first used in the 9th century BC, they were deployed in teams of two, where the second man held the archer's reins while he fired. This system was only used for a short while, and the Assyrians quickly became expert horsemen, using increasingly large numbers of horse archers and lancers, which gradually replaced most of the chariotry. The Assyrians were also great innovators in siege warfare, and are the earliest people we know of to have invented siege engines, used to breach and destroy the walls of an enemy city. When the Assyrians besieged a city, they first gave it an opportunity to surrender, with very minor repercussions. If the city did not surrender, the Assyrians would gather captives from the surrounding countryside. They would be brutally eviscerated within eyesight of the city's defenders. If the city still did not surrender and forced a siege, the Assyrians would have no mercy on them, and would frequently slaughter or enslave the city's entire population. Another tactic the Assyrians used to great effect was a mass deportation of a rebellious population to another area of the empire. In the 50 years after Tiglath-Pileser III took the throne, more than 400,000 people were deported from their homelands. The Assyrians were not only masters of destruction, but building as well. Like the later Romans, the Assyrians built a network of roads across their empire, and while on campaign, the army built a fortified camp each night. Another hallmark of the Assyrian Empire was fortified supply depots, where extra food, weapons, horses, and many other war materials were stockpiled. This allowed for a great flexibility of movement, knowing that the army could be replenished at many locations throughout the empire. All of this enabled the Assyrian army to move very fast, with Assyrian kings boasting that their armies were able to march 30 miles a day. Like the later Roman legions, the professional Assyrian standing army was often joined by provincial auxiliary troops, or vassal units, who were given to the Assyrian Empire as tribute from areas as far away as Greek settlements in Asia Minor. The most common tribute demanded by the Assyrian Empire was either precious metals, horses, or trained military units. 
The Assyrian army had a wide variety of troop types. Light infantry was often provided by Aramean vassal states in what is now Syria, and city-states in southern Mesopotamia. The Assyrians used slingers in conjunction with archers, making it extremely difficult for the enemy to block fire from multiple angles. During sieges and often during battles as well, archers were accompanied by shield bearers, behind which they could fire at the enemy in relative safety. A wide variety of infantry shields were used, and this likely reflected specialized battlefield rules. In addition to cavalry and the small, agile two-man chariot, the Assyrians also used a much heavier four-man chariot, which carried two shield bearers, an archer, and a driver, and could be extremely effective at breaking up enemy infantry formations. If you enjoyed this video, I believe you'll love the earlier video I made on the entire history of the Assyrian Empire. Big thanks to my patrons over on Patreon. This has been Epimetheus. Thank you so much for watching.